Hi, we're in the trial still of Iowa versus Zachary Keene. Well, while the detective is reading uh, or uh, playing the confess confession, I'll say confession, really interrogation statement from uh, the defendant here, I'd like to introduce my guest today. You know her well, Francie Hakes. How are you, Francie? <laughs> Good, Linda. Nice to be on with you. Nice to be on with you. Now, you have tried a number of these cases. Is this the most horrific case you have ever seen with a child who had been left for probably nine days and died of just dehydration and many other things? You know, Linda, it is horrific, and it is definitely right in the top of what I've seen and tried and prosecuted myself. I just... You know, it hurts your heart when you think about what this baby went through. The neglect uh, is it's staggering and unfathomable, really, as to how anyone could let this happen to their own child. I don't understand it. Uh, I, I know. Uh, I have the same feeling. And we're going to go back and continue to listen to the statement. Maybe we can get a little eye or a little uh, eye into the mindset, the brain of the dad. So tells me we're going to take a quick break and then on the other side we'll be back. So this is the murder case of Iowa versus Zachary Keene. Mr. Keene is on trial for the murder, the murder of his four-month-old son, Sterling. And the picture that you see right now is the courtroom. The detective is on the stand, and you see that they have a cheat sheet. They have a transcript along with the jury of what the statement is. And we know it's very hard for us to hear what Mr. Keene said in that statement. Uh, but the statement is not evidence. The statement that's in the transcript is not evidence. It's only what the jurors actually hear. So I want to discuss this little tidbit with Francie Hakes. Francie, you were a, a prosecutor of these horrific child abuse type crimes, and you talked to us before about this is way up there. Now, when you hear the transcript or you, you listen to a first statement of the defendant, do you always see the shreds of what may be the defense in that statement? I don't know, Linda. I'm not sure what defense they can put on at this point, because what I notice in the interview is that the defendant does not sound out of his mind crazy or high. And so what is his defense going to be that he neglected his child or abused his child by neglect, leaving him so long unattended if he doesn't have I was high as a defense? And he took a phone call during the interview. He seems completely rational. Well, do we know, though, you know, we're not, we see him now. This is a long time. He's cleaned up. You can see him. He's in the pinkish lilac shirt, uh, the way the, the tables are. They're kind of together, which is an unusual situation in the courtroom. Usually the defense and, and the prosecution are separated. They don't, not, not adjoining like we see here. But he, you know, he's been months and months and months and months. Uh, so we don't know whether his pupils were dilated. We don't know his, how his actions, we don't know what his weight was. I mean, doesn't that all go to the, the, actual um, initial investigators, how they perceived him, don't they have to talk to us about that along with the words? Absolutely. What he looked like, I mean, I'm, I'm surprised there's not video in this day and age. Even back when I was in Doherty County in South Georgia prosecuting as an assistant district attorney, they had videotaped interviews of the offenders so that a jury later can see things like demeanor, facial expressions, uh, how they react to the questions. Do they lean back? Do they lean forward? Do they resist? Do they shake their head? Do they look crazy? All these things are important, and so now we're going to have to rely on the police to tell the jury all those things. Wow. Well, that's why trials are so important. Every little detail in a trial is important because in every answer, in every word, there is a shred of what either the prosecution will do or what the defense will do. We'll discuss more of this, but we have to right now take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to throw right back into the courtroom. Wow, we are listening to the trial where the victim, the victim is a four-month-old baby named Sterling Keene. This is taking place in Iowa, and the detective on the stand is, is telling the jury about, he's actually walking the jury through, and they're now watching on a transcript that they can hear in their ear the audio of the interrogation of the father who was on trial for the murder of his child, murder. 
His name is Zachary Keen. So I'd like to go back to my guest, uh, Francie Hakes. Just hold on a second. We'll be right with you. Mike Korobonics is with us, and you all know him. He is an amazing defender from the state of New Jersey. I first met him in the federal courtroom around Christmas, where I took over a client that he had handled initially for about a, about a brief New York minute for me. Uh, but he was dressed in red. Hi, Mike. How are you? Oh, nice and and you. on this Halloween day, this is this case is horror. This is true, true horror on this case. But I have to ask you, you know, this network covered a few weeks ago the case of Brad Fields, where a four-month-old uh, child by the name of Gabby, Gabby died, um, and she had been scalded. She, she died of traumatic injuries. She had been uh, let to sleep on a cold, freezing floor. Um, she was punished every time she, she was going to go to the bathroom, and they had to change her diaper. I mean, can you compare this murder as to which was worse, the death under that circumstance or the death under a child abuse where the murder is through uh, circumstances where the abuse manifested an indifference to human life, which in New Jersey would have been an aggravated manslaughter, not a murder. Is there a comparison legally or morally? Well, I, this is such a difficult question because they're both such heinous crimes. I mean, you know, one is where somebody is totally acting out and, and punishing a four-year-old and injuring them day in, day out. The other one is a four-month-old, and the parents just don't care. And that child's dying a slow, horrific death. I mean, this, this four-month-old is, you know, you, you only could hope, and I don't know because I'm not a medical expert, that, that, that at four months old you're not aware of that or you're pain tolerance right, is greater. Right, that you don't have that, you have that infantile lapse of memory that you don't, you don't remember what is going on, right? It, it just seems like this death seems so much like torture. Well, there's so many abuse cases. I know I started out as a child abuse prosecutor and sex crimes unit prosecutor back, uh, in, I don't even want to say how long, and, and that's when child abuse was just coming to the forefront because people didn't believe that parents or, or could do this to, to their youngins. I mean, you know, we grew up in a house, obviously, we became lawyers, we grew up in a house that was very nurturing, but the amount of child abuse that goes on is in all, all different forms. Have you ever handled a case that you knew, though, that the parents really shouldn't be convicted of child abuse or seen a case where, where there had been abuse? Because we have had wrongful convictions on those. Well, I, I too was a prosecutor in Hudson County and I did my tour of duty in these sex crimes. Back then it was sex crimes was together with child abuse and, you know, I always found that the child abuse cases were very clear, you know, the ones where there was actual child right, abuse. The other right. ones were things that I think needed more of an intervention by well, some sort of social, social service services. than the criminal justice system. Well, it, it, it is so horrific for these young children. But I want to go to our chat room, and I'd like to answer that question in our chat room. Which was worse, the death, if you can compare them and tell me why, the death of this young child, uh, Sterling Keene, or the death of Gabby, uh, the four-year-old child of Brad Fields? Who was the worst criminal, morally or legally, in your opinion? And now we have to take a quick break. We have breaking news. You got to stay with us. There is a verdict in the penalty phase of the love trial in Texas. Remember, the jury heard closing arguments this morning. Now, Mike, uh, quickly to you because I know New Jersey doesn't lo doesn't have the death penalty, but it doesn't seem to me to be very good if they were out for about you know a few hours. It, it just seems overwhelming for if the they defense. come to this kind of yeah. If they, they come to this kind of decision, they 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 were I would think they're stuck in their their view is quite overwhelming. Which, which you would think they'd get, they're giving him death, yes. right? And Francie, um, on the Christopher Love trial, uh, I know you've been following it, and, and we're also watching the courtroom, as you can see, as we're discussing this case. He cold heartedly and just executed this, this woman, Kendra Hatcher, with a gun to the back of her head. I mean, you see any, case, any way that they could, he could have avoided the death penalty, if, assuming that's what he gets? I don't think so, Linda. I mean, it's one of those cases where it is an absolute execution. And so I think that it's most likely the jury has found that there are enough aggravating factors to decide to impose the death penalty, the ultimate penalty. And it certainly seems deserved in this case. And Mike, even when New Jersey had the death penalty and all mm -hmm. the states have, have this uh, system where it's the jury has to find aggravating factors beyond uh, a reasonable doubt and the defense, they can, they can show uh, factors, mitigating factors by preponderance of the 
the evidence, and then the jury gets each one, each person weighs that individually. That's the system that, that protects the constitutionality of the death penalty. Now, do you think overall there should be a death penalty in any state, or in this case for anyone, given the fact that the mastermind is not going to get the death penalty because that was the agreement that we took Ms. Delgado back from Mexico uh, and won't give her the death penalty in order to get her back? It, it's such a, the death penalty is such a, a hot topic and it's so dis divisive and it, it just seems, you know, we've been around long enough to know that although it sounds good for rhetoric, we know that people get wrongfully convicted and it's a little shocking to me that a verdict's back this quick when people have somebody's life in their hands. But, but on the other hand, Francie, you know, when you have a, a woman who is innocent, she didn't even know she was being targeted by anyone, being followed by, by these two. And that was also uh, Crystal Cortez, who got $500 for driving the getaway car uh, to go kill her. And she knew that there was going to be a murder, uh, right? Uh, isn't this the case that the death penalty was made for this case and the case uh, of, obviously, Pittsburgh, the shooting at the synagogue? Aren't these a case? Aren't these the worst of the worst? They are the worst of the worst. And with respect to how fast the verdict might seem, remember, there was a guilt-innocence phase first. Right. So they heard all the evidence really twice. So even if it's only been a few hours, they deliberated a long time in this case when you also look at the guilt-innocence phase. And I just, the evidence was overwhelming. I don't see any problem with a fast well, verdict. That, that's assuming, Mike, that we have a death verdict, which we're assuming based on the quickness of it. Assuming we have, though, but there was something you said earlier that really rang to me about why I don't think this is the perfect case for it. It's a horrific crime, but you know, you also have to look at the defendant and the mitigation of that defendant or defendants. I mean, obviously you had two young people, drugs were involved, somebody did this for $500. It's not something where you, these defendants appear to be thinking clearly or had the ability to. So I think that's, I'm, I'm not for the death but is penalty. It, but is, isn't the death penalty supposed to be about the worst of the worst? Francine, and you can chime in here too. The worst of the worst, and then you have the victim statement, you see that she's the best of the best. Uh, I mean, you know, this is a, a case in the, in the past that we would say, hey, there's a proportionality. I see that Mr. Love has just been brought into his seat, that, but there's a proportionality because he is African American and the victim is white. In the past, the argument of proportionality, which means that that he shouldn't get the death penalty because it goes proportionally more to minorities than it does to white on white crime. That's the big issue in the death penalty cases. But isn't this just a happenstance of this case, or do you think that's a real issue for appeal, Francie? Well, I think it's an issue they'll raise on appeal for sure, but it seems to me that you've got such a callous indifference to life, taking money to kill another human being that you don't even know, that's what the death penalty was made for. Well, you know, in, in Texas, they do things very quickly, as we saw when the verdict was taken yesterday. It was like, you know, here's your verdict. Usually, you know, you get up, you hand the, the forms, go to the, uh, the bailiff, then they go up to the judge. Here it was like we're taking your verdict. So that's why we're keeping a close eye on this, because as soon as we see any movement or hear anything in that courtroom, we're going to go right to it, even if it cuts one of our guests off. Now, going back to the, the whole death penalty discussion, Texas leads, leads the country in terms of people they have executed. Why is that? Well, I, obviously, that's a society that is a lot more. Oh, they're standing up in the courtroom. Established in their ways. I mean, Stands, Texas. Okay. Uh, so, is this Texas is very pro gun. They're very law and order. And I don't mean to generalize, but one of the problems here, I still think, is, you know, one of the things for the death penalty is supposed to be deterrence. I think the more heinous crime is the person who is of sound mind, supposedly, takes ten thousand dollars, plans something out. Obviously, somebody came to me. All right, we have to go right back into the courtroom, Mike. We have to cut you off. Here we go. Wow. Well, I, I mean, I don't, don't know what to say. That was, you heard the victim impact statements. The last statement was from the mother. The other ones, we believe, from the sister and the brother of doctor, as the mother pointed out, Dr. Kendra Hendricks. She has been living. She said that Mr. Kevin Christopher Love is the executioner uh, and that she's lived with this three years, 57 days. Uh, she thanked the jury. Uh, and what got me there, um, uh, Francie and Mike, Mike first, Mike, is that there was no reaction from Christopher Love, none. He just was stone-faced. I, I noticed that as well, and I think there comes a point in time with the defendant in this kind of case where they're, they're sort of accepting of where their fate is, and they become, for lack of a better term, ready for the next life. Oh, I don't know about that. Uh, Francie, uh, are you with me?
Yeah, I'm yeah. here, Linda. I, I, I have to disagree. I, I mean, th this shows me his complete lack of emotion. I, I was struggling to maintain my emotions just watching those three impact statements, and especially from the doctor's mother, who so appropriately called him the executioner. Right, it right. looked like she was ready to fall and, and out. Fancy, I mean, one other thing I, I would add to that is that his family testified on his behalf and his family his mother and and, and father were, were sobbing sobbing like babies at one point and 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 uh, apologized apologized to the family for all they went through in this three years and 57 days when she was and she was executed this was a back to the head bullet uh, for five hundred dollars in drugs does the family ever get any type of, of anything any relaxation any feeling of, of ending uh, because it's a long haul from here out in I mean this because he gets a death penalty doesn't mean he's gonna go right to the chair no, but, that's right. And it's definitely going to take years. It may yeah. take a decade or Mike, more. Let me get Mike's opinion. What do you think about that? What do you think about the family and, and what they have to go through? Do you think it should be this long? Well, the collateral damage of families who had nothing to do with this, and that's still collateral someone's damage, child. Right. Right. And, and it's, it's, it's difficult because, you know, the Constitution, that's why a lot of states, beside things, don't have the death penalty because it's so exhaustive of constitutional remedies that it winds up costing well, what, the state. What, and what Mike is saying is that it takes so long, it takes so long to uh, deal with the appeals and all, and, and some have been merit, meritful, but here it seems to be almost a slam dunk uh, that there was an execution and a murder for hire. Now, what is going to happen next? The judge is going to sign three warrants, one for the defense, one for the prosecution, and one for the governor that's going to say he gets put to death and we will follow this case but right now we have to take a quick break well we're still all shaking here in the studio having listened to the death penalty verdict in the case of Texas versus Christopher Love when Dr. Kendra Hack Hatcher who was executed his mom took the stand and discussed discussed her three years and 57 days of hell. Mike, uh, how do you appeal something like that when really the, the appeal for all of us, even those of us who are against the death penalty, is like, wow, we see why it exists, especially for this kind of case. There's no doubt, regardless of what your belief, belief is as towards the death penalty, that mother's impact, impact her, her articulation of what it was like. I, that three years, 57 days, almost came as like a mantra. I mean, I think a lot of prosecutors should listen to that right, for a summation. Right, and Francie, Francie, what I was impressed about how she, you know, she obviously didn't know whether she wanted to do that or leave it to her children to talk about the impact, but she got on and she first thanked the jury. She, she just was as gracious as you could imagine. And then she slowly turned. You couldn't even make this up if you were directing her. She slowly turned to, to uh, Mr. Love, uh, and uh, whether you can call him that. And, and she says, I don't call you your name at all. Uh, you were the shooter, but now you're the executioner. How, how a mother can, can get on the stand and have that ability, I guess, for her daughter to do that, uh, it, it always amazes me in death penalty cases. It does. Her anguish was something to behold. It was terrible, but it was powerful. And the thing that disturbed me the most was something you mentioned in the last segment, and that was his absolute stone-faced reaction to her anguish at his acts. He still today, three years later, obviously does not give a damn. And I would have had him testify in the penalty stage. I would have. What about you? I think you see, you, were, you made a good point, and I agree with you 100%. The fact she didn't refer, as defense attorneys, we want to humanize our client as much right. as possible. She did what a prosecutor should do and called him the executioner, what he is from a legal standpoint. And I think, yes, in a case like this, you have nothing to lose by putting your client on. You can only go up. And, and in fact, that's what he is, not only from a legal standpoint, that's what Christopher Love is from a factual standpoint. He executed Dr. Kendra Hatcher executed Dr. Kendra Hatcher. Let me say it one more time. He executed Dr. Kendra Hatcher. And as a defense attorney, he is not one of the clients I would want to represent, even though I give people who represent him the greatest, the greatest uh, ability. I say that, that God bless you, but um, it is just evil at its worst. But before we continue to talk about more evil, we still have to go to break, and then we'll be back 
to discuss the various cases that you can only see here on Law and Crime Network. Top crime stories trending on lawandcrime.com and across the country. Authorities in Missouri have reportedly found the body of missing four-year-old Darnell Gray, who disappeared from his Jefferson City home last week. Darnell disappeared from his home on Buena Vista Street a week ago, and his body was discovered after an expanded search by law enforcement and volunteers. Investigators will now switch gears to find Darnell's killer. A team from North Carolina accused of fatally shooting a fellow student at a high school near Charlotte was charged with murder. 16-year-old Jotwan Cuffey reportedly fatally shot 16-year-old Bobby McKeithen before the start of classes at Butler High School, and authorities believe the shooting was prompted by bullying. Cuffey made his first court appearance yesterday and was ordered held without bond pending a hearing on November 7th. Authorities in central Illinois believe they have located the bodies of a college professor and her husband after their son was charged with their killings. 21-year-old Jose Ramirez allegedly told investigators he dumped his parents, 63-year-old Susan Brill de Ramirez and Antonio Ramirez Barron off a bridge in Peoria. Authorities reportedly found blood and signs of a struggle after a relative called deputies to the couple's home. Ramirez now faces two counts of murder. Those were today's top crime stories. I'm Anthony Velez for Law & Crime. Dr. Kendra Hendricks was executed by Christopher Love for apparently $500 in drugs. The family spoke. We're going to go back into the courtroom and replay for you in case you missed it because it's so powerful. The sister of Dr. Kendra Hendricks. You know, I was so upset by the victim impact statements. I even got Dr. Kendra Hatcher's name wrong. I said Hendricks, Hatcher, Hatcher. But that's how upset even I, a seasoned defense attorney, was. Francie Hakes, when, when you get this upset and, and, and you're us sitting out here and with goosebumps and, and you can't even remember, your brain is going on, on some kind of uh, motion that it normally doesn't go on. Um, how do you cope with that when you're representing somebody in the courtroom? When the family is talking to him like that, talking to Christopher Love, the executioner, like that, how do you how do you deal with it as an attorney? Linda, I think that's such a great point, and it's something I talk about on the podcast that I co-host, Best Case, Worst Case, where we talk to our listeners and do interviews with law enforcement officials, current and former, and they talk about how these very kinds of cases impact them and their lives. And I think it's something that you don't think about, but even watching, you can see it's impossible, unless you're a stone-faced executioner, not to get emotional when watching the anguish that these families have to live with. And I don't discount the anguish the defendant's family has to live with. They're not responsible for his actions, but they also have to live with it. Crime is such a terrible, terrible thing. It impacts everyone, you not are, just you the are, victim. You are so right. You are so right. There are so many victims. And we're going to listen to one of the prime victims, the mother, the mother of Dr. Kendra Hatcher. Well, seeing it the second time may be even worse than seeing it the first time, but that was Mrs. Bonnie Jamison. She is the mother of Dr. Kendra Hatcher, who was executed with a gun to the back of the head by the defendant here who just got the death penalty. His name is Christopher Love. Now, we have heard in the past day the sentencing hearing of Christopher Love. Um, the mother had testified at trial. I don't know if you followed it, and, and she was very composed. But this family now has to go through this again with Miss Brenda Delgado, Miss Delgado's trial, uh, who was extradited back from Mexico. Delgado was the girlfriend of Mr. Ricardo Panianga, who is, uh, was now the new boyfriend and apparently going to be the husband, from what we can see, of Miss um, Hatcher. So how does the family now cope with this? How's the family cope with this? Another trial. We, we had talked about it actually when we were off camera a little bit about, you know, some of these trials because of constitutional issues have to be separated, whether someone, you know, in their statement inculpates, inculpates a de defendant who you can't cross-examine. But, but let me hope. just stop you. The, the emotional aspect of it, um, they, they don't want to hear, this family doesn't want to hear about the, his constitutional rights. Uh, Th that's exactly right. And the standard I, I would hope, I would hope in this situation the prosecutor's office would talk to the family and see if they could hopefully resolve Delgado's case short of trial. I'm but then sure this, there's but is be... that going to be fair? Then Francie, Francie Hakes, 
Is that is it what Mike Korobonik said? Is that going to be fair that the mastermind now has to, would get a deal basically when Christopher Love is who probably was uh, somebody she could ply with five hundred dollars and some drugs uh, didn't get a deal? Is that fair? I mean, is the justice system fair? Is what I'm getting about. We have a death of Kendra Hatcher. We have the mother who has to go through this. We have the mastermind not getting the death penalty. We have this guy getting the death penalty. What solace can we take in this? Well, it isn't fair, Linda. I don't think we can take any solace. That's the deals that sometimes have to be made with other countries who don't believe in the death penalty in order to get where she apparently fled. In order to get Delgado back, we had to agree not to seek the death penalty. So there will be some small measure of justice, but you're absolutely right. It isn't fair to the family. Now, love was treated perfectly appropriately and appropriately got the death penalty. And, and Francie, I'm going to I'm gonna have to cut you yeah. off right there. We're going to have to go to a break. Uh, we're going to use this time when we're on break to get our composure back because we are all rattled here in the studio by this this mother and this family and uh, God bless God bless dr. Kendra Hatcher I mean. so that was via love she is defendant Christopher loves mom and earlier today she talked to the jury through the defense attorney but she talked directly to the jury in an attempt to save her son's life for the execution of Dr. Kendra Hendricks. Kendra Hatcher, I'm still, I'm still lost my composure with this case. I don't know why. I do know why, because it's horrible, Mike Car Carbonics. Horrible. I, I just, I don't understand how uh, he could take a life so, for such a cheap amount of money. His life was so cheap to him. And I think that's what the jury would struggle with, right? It, it has to be, but that's one of the things that you, you wonder what the psychological makeup of this young man was. I mean, I know they call him the executioner, but we've been on the side of the table sitting and listening to that. And we're defense attorneys, and you have to be accustomed, if you're a professional, to deal with those issues. And, you know, this is a, there, there's no justice in this case. This is just Well, no matter horrible. who did this to her daughter, these people are victims, right? Uh, not, not the mother of, because uh, she may be, but let me just uh, go to Francie on this. Francie, I wrote down here, when he's been incarcerated in jail the other times, he's always been respectful. He's a respectful uh, young man. Um, there, there's something about trying to save your son's life on a murder case, but having to tell the jury, well, the other times he was incarcerated, we didn't see any issues with him, which sounds like there's a tone deafness in, in some way. I know. Defendant's mother. It, it's a terrible situation for her to be in. Uh, she's obviously distraught. And it's like I said before, crime destroys many lives. And a heinous oh. killing like this destroys more than just the victim. Right, right. There, there's, I always say there's a gray and there's a white side or a gray and a black side of, of these kind of crimes. And everybody is affected. And we're going to see Via Love really turn to the jury now and, and make the final plea for her son's life. Well, I, I do feel sorry about the death of the dentist, and I do feel sorry about her family and that they have to go through something like this. And I do, I don't think that any, I don't think that any mother should see her child die. I really don't. So, that's it. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Ma'am, do you need a break before I ask you a question? Yeah. Uh... No mother should have to lose a child to either death or the death penalty. So while we get our composure back, let's go, we're going to take a quick break. See you on the other side. Well, that was Kendra Hatcher's best friend, Dr. Tammy Pantano, talking about how this homicide, how this murder, how this execution has affected her. And while you heard the word I a lot, you did that because when crimes occur to your loved ones, when people love you, they do get affected. And that's the whole point of victim impact statements. Mike, you know, I remember um, when I was a youngster growing up, I had a cousin by my grandmother's uh, uh, being a big Italian family, a stepsister's marriage who was abducted in the local town of Monmouth County and her body was never found but through a serial killer. And I can remember being small and hearing my parents da, 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 and they wouldn't let me go to the store, they wouldn't let me ride the bike. They were affected even though they were removed. Is it appropriate to have a jury hear this kind of testimony uh, when you're discussing 
not having emotion driving verdicts? Well, I, 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 I think this was, she was in a penalty phase, I believe. Right. So I, I, I think, you know, I, I think it brings to the forefront the fact that we don't live in vacuums and that effect, that actions people have have a ripple effect. And people, you know, hear, people see, people talk, people get nervous. I mean, this reminded me, I re remember a prosecutor once saying that if you want to judge the victim of a crime, look at the people who were surrounding him at the time of his death. Usually they do that to counteract cross-examiners and saying yeah, what bad people but, but they that were. Brings me to this a, is so ironic yeah, but that here brings me to, was, to a question. You just said it. Francie, I'd like to bring you in on this, because should you be judging the victim of a crime? Should you just say, just take them for what they are? You're the victim of a crime. Why do we, why do we have to judge them? I guess the other talk side would be why do we have to hear from them? Francie, are you with me? I am here. Yeah. And we have to hear from the victim and their family sure. and friends. They are the voice for the victim. And that's is so important in murder cases, especially because the victim cannot speak for herself. Someone has to, to remind the jury right. that the photographs they've seen or the video of the crime is of a but, real But Francie, let me interrupt you. We, we can hear from the victim, but in Texas, they have this thing where the victims picture is up against looking at the jury and and you know I think that eventually well, that will hit the US Supreme Court not that it will be successful about whether that's necessary whether emotion drives then a verdict because I know I want to do right by her right well the defendant took her life she can't be present in the courtroom so I think having her photograph there is perfectly appropriate like, you know, I, I, I don't think it's appropriate I think it's appropriate for the point in time when they refer to her when they talk about it, but to have it there while people are supposed to be focusing, because the jury instruction is you are not to reach a decision till you've heard all the testimony. And to have a picture of a victim or an alleged victim prior to the jury having a verdict is distracting to those people who are testifying about facts in that case on that witness stand. Well, th thank you, Mike and Francie, for all of your, your viewpoints here. I just would like to point out that no matter what the situation and what happened in the court, even if this goes on appeal, even if it were to get reversed, that's not going to change the fact that Dr. Kendra Hatcher was a victim in this case, that she was killed for no reason at all, for $500 and some drugs, because some woman has some jealousy, and she is never going to be brought back to life, and her family are always going to be victims. And, Dr. and Christopher Love, what he's done to his family, because yes, he did it to his family, is also should be faulted for that. It's a terrible situation. We can only watch it try to be part of it, try to make it better. This is Linda Gennivod, and I'm signing off now for Law & Crime Network. They'll be back next with Aaron's show. Stay tuned.